Welcome to the Climate Teacher Ed webinar for this month, hosted by the Institute for Science and Math Education at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm Phil Bell, faculty member in the College of Education. Uh, it's great to see a familiar name showing up in the chat. So please go ahead and introduce yourself and say where you're joining from. That would be fabulous if you're willing to share. Uh, thanks for joining today. We have a, an amazing set of ideas and um, kind of background uh, work that is going to be shared with you today. Uh, this particular webinar series is an activity of the Climate Teacher Ed Collaborative, a new teacher education initiative dedicated to helping future teachers learn how to engage youth in community climate justice projects and in civic participation in response to the climate crisis. It, we, we really hope that this monthly um, webinar ser series will be of use to teacher educators writ large. And uh, each month we stop and talk with experts who have been engaged in that work uh, to help us think about what we can uh, engage uh, future teachers around and like learn about how to do this uh, important work um, that's ahead of us all. Uh, we encourage you to check out the educator learning resources that will be dropped there in the in the chat. Um, we've been compiling um, different pieces on our stemteachingtools.org website, and uh, it will include in the future lessons um, that are derived from this particular webinar series, so stay tuned for those. And as we find our way into conversation today, we're, we're using the Zoom webinar functionality. And so please post your questions that you might have along the way through the Q&A functionality that you can find typically right there at the bottom. And we'll bring them into the, into the conversation. So the University of Washington uh, in Seattle operates on, and I live on the lands of the Lashoot Seed speaking peoples, the Coast Salish peoples who identify as the Duwamish, Makoshut, Suquamish, Nequalami, Tulalip, and Poyallup um, peoples. We're immensely grateful for their stewardship of, the, of these lands and waters um, since time immemorial, and we work to support their sovereignty as tribal nations in the work that we do, and that certainly extends to matters of educational sovereignty for the purposes of their own cultural continuance and thriving, and has very specific uh, implications for a just climate response in society. And today we'll be opening up dimensions of that around environmental justice um, issues that show up within community and might disrupt relations that need to be repaired and brought forward through a community led effort. So um, we're gonna hold that thread throughout the discussion. I'm so thrilled to have Dr. Kelly Lee and Dr. Juan Manuel Rubio uh, with us today. Thank you both for making time at a very busy time um, in the world to, um, to be with us. Uh, they will be sharing really important work that they are engaged in, uh, bringing educators into a space where they can teach about the history of lead poisoning uh, that was discovered in a particular part of California and was disproportionately impacting communities of color there. And so we're gonna use that work to um, really understand how secondary science educators can leverage environmental and climate justice topics and phenomena to really unlock the potential of education, uh, hence the title for today. So we're so excited uh, to have each of you here. I'm gonna introduce each of you a bit and then maybe you can round out the introduction uh, individually. So Dr. Kelly Lee has been in the educational field for about a decade, at first as a high school science educator, then instructional coach, and now educational leader. She's currently the director of the UC Irvine Science Project and authored an awesome new book for next-gen science standards implementation, teaching climate change for grades six through 12. And we'll drop those links uh, in the chat as well. Dr. Lee serves as an executive committee member of the UC CSU Environmental and Climate Change Literacy Projects Initiative. She's a board member of 10 Strands and a Climate Reality Corps mentor. Dr. Lee is joined by uh, her collaborator, Dr. Juan Manuel Rubio, who's a historian of capitalism and the environment, writing primarily about conflicts between mining industries and indigenous communities in the Americas. As part of his local environmental justice work, he investigated the historical source, sources of soil contamination in Southern California, which we'll be hearing about today. Dr. Rubio's work seeks to use history to advance environmental science and environmental justice. And I just love the, the interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approaches that we're gonna be uh, learning about today. So, so excited to have you here and maybe each of you could just say a little bit more about yourselves. Uh, Dr. Lee. Hi everybody, so nice to connect with you today. And um, again, during such a challenging, difficult um, time, we thought, you know, this these topics are so urgent and we just can't wait to address them any longer. 
Um, I grew up in inner city LA and um, you'll hear a little bit about my motivations, but also what is driving me to continue to do this work and also to collaborate with amazing individuals like Dr. Rubio uh, to enhance what science education could be for the 21st century. And so um, as we continue chatting more today, I, I think slowly we'll reveal a little bit more about, again, all of those important aspects of why we do this work. So I'll hand it off to Dr. Rubio in case he wants to add something as well. Thank you, um, Kelly. Um, I, I do appreciate the invitation to, to discuss you know, um, education, discuss social engagement, discuss justice in, in, a, in an environmental, um, you know, with, with, a, with a, you know, a, a particular attention to environmental issues. And of course, I'm very thankful to the Climate Teacher Ed Collab uh, Collaborative for, for the invitation for coordinating an event. And um, I, I, I don't think I wanna add too much about myself. We'll, we'll talk about the issues. Um, my background is, yes, it's a bit interdisciplinary. I come from political science, history, Latin American studies. Uh, I was born in, in, in Cordoba, Argentina, and uh, that's where I grew up and uh, migrated to the US um, after I finished college. Um, and um, since then I've been sort of involved in different, um, educational spaces, right? Different universities, different settings. So happy to discuss some of those uh, dynamics as well. So thank you. That's awesome. Well, welcome to you both. I'm really excited to think about the local, the kind of hyper-local and the global dimensions of the work, um, the historical unfoldings that relate to our current circumstance and possible futures. And also about just like how secondary education could be more focused around interdisciplinary investigations and sense making. So just so many um, really important uh, edges to the work that I kind of wanted to kind of just name up front. Um, we have a series of, of conversational pieces to open up over the next hour and our um, Dr. Lee and Dr. Rubio are gonna you know, open up the details of the work. We wanted to start with a very broad framing question. Um, you know, just about, you know, are K-12 science educators teaching 21st century issues of today or tomorrow? And should they be? And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters to help us think about that important question. So we'll just start um, by, I, I guess I'll just start by talking about an article that I came across pretty recently. It was an EdSource article, and it was for math specifically. And in this article, it talked about um, how math uh, taught today is um, completely about, uh, you know, uh, rote memorization, lack of application of knowledge, um, you know, all, all those things, but wasn't written or contributed by any educators. These are people outside of education saying, this is our perception of how math is taught. I'm not saying I agree or disagree, but in the article, they were advocating to cancel all math courses then from K to 12. They said, if students can learn all those concepts by just Googling them, what's the point of spending all those years teaching about something they can just look up online and probably will not even apply? And as harsh as that sounds, I encourage all of us in, in um, thinking about what it is that we teach or that we're supporting students with, with that same question. If somebody said to us, if I'm canceling your class tomorrow, what would students really be missing that they couldn't just look up? That's a question that we have to grapple with because in this day and age with the advancements of technology and innovation, how we have to teach today has to mimic the needs of today. And so when we're thinking about whether or not educators are teaching to the 21st century issues of today and tomorrow, climate and environmental science and justice are directly relevant to what students are, um, uh, are advocating for, want more of, and are bombarded with in terms of information on a daily basis, if not already in their own lived experiences. And so when we're thinking about um, how to tend to those issues and whether or not it's relevant, I just have to share, you know, growing up um, in my own community, I was three houses down from the freeway and I, I never knew a difference. I didn't know that I was breathing a different type of air. I didn't know of the noise pollution. I didn't know really any of those things until I stepped out 
and then moved, you know, across from the train tracks and then down from the downwind from the refinery. And it was just normal to close your windows when the flaring events were happening. It was normal for me as a teacher to tell students, we have to stay indoors because, you know, that there's really bad gases that are outside. We can smell it. We can see it. It's normal. It's normal, right, for this type of community. And it was normal for me because I went back to teach where I grew up. But in looking at my own experiences growing up, I in those neighborhoods, I never once learned about not only climate change, but I never learned about environmental justice. I didn't have those opportunities and I keep thinking and replaying it back. If I did, would that somehow activate agency within myself to want to take action? Because I noticed today with a lot of the curriculum, we're making so much headway, we're, we're progressing so much, but it seems that a lot of the curriculum stops shy of justice. We get through the science, we'll teach climate science, we'll teach about environmental science, but when we get to the part where we can activate agency and tell students, we recognize your lived realities, we recognize that it, it may be different than what others are experiencing, let's talk about that. Let's get into the ethical dimensions of the science because this is what you really want to know so that you can actually take action on them. And so to answer that question, should we do it? whether or not we decide to have those moments in our class, the safe moments to explore those dimensions in our class, our students are bombarded with that information regardless. And they shouldn't have to choose between content or context. They're complementary. They need each other. And they, they, they just, again, um, uh, get students to really think through, how can I apply this to improve something about my reality, something about the world, something that I care deeply about? And so having said that, I loved this collaboration with Dr. Rubio because his work allowed for us to really think through how students are directly impacted in terms of a system that's in place that unless unveiled, how would we know? Just like myself growing up, how would I have known that I was breathing different air and unless I stepped out of it, unless somebody kind of broke that window for me? Any thoughts on that, Dr. Rubio? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, and what I have to add to that is that um, the curriculum that we have today is a product of history, right? That the way we've arrived to this perhaps narrative about like science having to be detached, you know, from, from society or from biases and so on, um, from the community um, is a particular product of history. Um, you know, it's, uh, we were very much focused on objective standards, right? We're focused on, you know, the, this idea that, you know, science is uh, rational, there, therefore it should be sort of like isolated from society. Uh, and that's that's a particular discourse in time, right? Like it was very prominent in the '80s and in sort of carried over into the, you know, 2000s. You know, with a you know strong focus on on standardized testings and things like that. You know, these objective measures. Um, but you know, if we think within within the context of a school and how we teach science in schools, I don't think that you know. Um, schools, I mean, I don't think communities uh, experience schools in those terms, right? Like, I don't think, right? Like, it, it, schools live within a community, right? And there were, you know, there were social movements in the 1960s that actually engaged with that idea, right? Like, that saw schools as a site of, of community building, a site of struggle, a site where social justice could be enacted not just debated, right? Um, and that is perhaps something that we're now trying to go back to, this idea that, you know, as teachers, we should be completely engaged with, you know, the, 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 the struggle for transformation, right? And, and there are particular pedagogical approaches that, that emphasize that, right? And, and I'm happy to share some, of, some, some references um, later on, but, you know, there's, um, a critical um, pedagogical framework, for example, coming from a critical Latinx um, studies uh, that emphasize, you know, this idea that we have to care, right? As educators, we have to care for our students 
in a comprehensive and community oriented way, right? That emotions are actually part of our pedagogical uh, approach. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is perhaps uh, challenge that paradigm of objective, you know, detached, isolated science. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so thanks for opening up all those different dimensions of it. it um, we also see kind of the youth in especially disproportionately impacted communities like this is their lived daily reality and they want to be engaging in it. So, um, Dr. Lee, as you're saying, like maybe they don't actually have a firm, you know, insight into what's happening because that hasn't been a focus of education and that actually that that disconnect is like deeply, deeply troubling. Um, and so figuring out, well, how can kind of a, a curriculum or a set of experiences resource their agency in response towards more just futures, towards engaging in, in movement project with, uh, with others, with making schools the site of struggle, Dr. Rubio, as you're saying. And I, I do think like in our field, there's been a, or a lot in our learning sciences field, there's been this shift towards um, kind of socio-political theories of learning, which actually center a lot of these possibilities and histories kind of in important new ways. And um, there's a lot of new potential to work with. And it's just not our, our history as you're uh, helping us uh, remember Dr. Rubio. I wanted, so with that as kind of a, a shared image of, of focusing on these contemporary environmental justice issues, like what are just some of the implications that come up when you work with secondary science teachers? Like um, what issues or possibilities, you know, show up at that moment? And then we'll like, you know, go towards examples a bit, a little bit after. Yeah, so I, I I was a former teacher, as you shared earlier, um, and it, I have to say it's not easy. It, saying all of this, of course, is easier yeah. than actually enacting it. Yeah. And when you're also potentially doing this for the first time, um, there the the subjects are are sensitive, right? The topics are sensitive, but also um, so tentative in nature you don't know which way it's going to go when you are actually leading students or guiding students down this path to explore those ethical dimensions of the science. And that can be kind of scary for a teacher who um, may have everything well thought out and although is positioning students to drive that um, lesson or drive that unit in specific ways and recognizes the need um, to be more culturally relevant and, and sees and hears all of this and, and is thinking, Yes, I, I hear it. I believe it. I'm right there with you. But how do I start? I just want to first recognize that it's not easy. And I, I have worked with a lot of educators who will tell me they feel this is essential, but how it plays out um, requires a lot of intentionality and reflection. And so um, I appreciate that you brought up the book earlier. Um, and the first way that I generally start with teachers is through that self-reflection process because strategies don't change practices. Don't get me wrong, strategies are important and sometimes we need them. <laughs> but if we're really thinking through how to change pedagogical practice, you have to start with teachers' underlying beliefs and values. First, acknowledging that this work is essential and that you want to do it is a very first important step. Um, but then asking yourself those questions of, you know, are you comfortable taking on tentative topics that don't have straightforward answers? Climate change specifically is an ongoing investigation, although we have a lot of data and knowledge and information to shed light on what's currently happening and models into the uh, future. They're just models and predictions of what might be. Um, but at the same time, thinking through, well, am I comfortable taking that on with students if I myself have to do a lot of learning? Um, asking yourself those reflective questions are important, and then thinking through the decisions that we're making in the classroom. They're all informed by our underlying beliefs and values, and left unchecked could potentially do some harm, even if you're unaware. Um, and so the example I always give, and I know it's extreme, but it paints the picture well enough that again, if I, or, you know, again, if I was a racist, say I was a racist and you came into my school and gave me professional development on anti-racist science practices, right? Or strategies. If I, if I just, you know, implement all of those strategies, it doesn't make me no longer a racist. And 
my underlying beliefs and values permeate then through other decisions I'm making in the classroom with students, whether I'm aware or not. And so unveiling first those beliefs and values and asking yourself why we're making the decisions we're making, that's an essential first step. So if you decide, I can't take on the ethical dimensions, I don't feel it's right in a science class, I don't think it belongs there, it belongs in a social science class, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or on the flip end, no, I wanna take this on. I think it can build students complex critical thinking skills. I think this can develop their scientific literacy skills. You have a belief about teaching and learning for the 21st century and you're enacting that. But if you don't sit and reflect and think for yourself, why did I make that decision? Again, um, the being unintentional about it, um, but doesn't allow for you to, to inform your decisions in the ways that you're hoping. And so in the ways that it plays out is collaboration is key, reflection. We all do it all the time. I think one of the things the teacher said to me before that made me laugh because it's so true is I reflect so much, I don't have time to reflect. <laughs> and um, I feel like that is true to a certain extent. But when we're thinking about these deep topics and you think to yourself, I'm not ready to take them on. Are you not ready to take them on because you feel or believe something about the students in front of you? Is it that you feel or believe something about your abilities or your own values? We have to be intentional with, with why we feel that way. So that way we can decide to move forward or to understand what our current challenges are, then to take steps to move forward, right? And so identifying um, current um, and local community organizations that's a really good first step, not advocating for a certain environmental justice group, but just saying to students, you know what, there's a lot going on in our community. There's a lot of people doing something about this. Are you aware? And that's a really good way to even shed light on current issues, um, acknowledging that students come to the class with a deep wealth of knowledge and acknowledging that learning comes in very different forms. And it's a, it's a cultural act. Right, And so when we know that they have deep funds of knowledge, we'll position them differently when we say, when you authentically say, I, I will position you as the driver of this unit or this lesson, it's not performative. It's because it's your underlying belief that is guiding you to make those decisions and you're trusting your students to co-construct that experience with you. Even if you don't have all the answers, you can model that process and nature of science with them. And so I know um, these first steps I feel are, are within reach for all of us to think through. Um, and before we get into concrete examples, I, I just wanted to pass it to Dr. Ruby as well to get some insights that he has. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I, I, I guess the, the one thing I would add is, is um, it is really important to be issue oriented, right? To design lesson plans, uh, perhaps projects, um, that are really engaged with one, uh, social justice, environmental justice, racial justice issue, right? And, um, you know, acknowledging that even if you're teaching environmental science, that the science, that the science that has been produced has a history, right? It, it, it's not perfect, uh, not at all. Actually, we know that, you know, um, even science that has, you know, very modern science, you know, uh, for example, research on diseases, you know, there's, there are certain topics that are over-researched and certain diseases that are under-researched, particularly those that affect the global South, right? There are racial inequities in the way that, you know, science operates, uh, the assumptions that are present in, in, in the way that studies are designed. Um, in the case of lead science, you know, since I'm introducing now a bit of, of the topic in the case of lead science, for most of most of the 20th century, um, there was a very um, heavy influence from corporate science, because the lead industry had a lot of investment in how, um, you know, lead products were circulating in our society. And, you know, there was a lot of like, um, doubt being cast on the studies of certain scientists that were saying, actually, it looks like lead can be very hazardous, particularly for children, right? So we continue to use these products for way longer than we should have. Um, and that is just an example of how, you know, how science operates within a context. And 
that would be perhaps the very first step of designing an issue oriented you know lesson plan or project acknowledging the history of the science that you're going to teach right and second perhaps acknowledging the current deficiencies right um in the case of lead science well we don't know a whole lot about like where the lead comes from right we know there's quite a bit of research about lead poisoning you know after lead is in people's bloods particularly children but we don't know what's the environmental cause of lead poisoning and that's sort of what we are intervening right and that has very important implications for uh, environmental justice and racial justice because the people that live close to hazardous areas tend to be communities of color and that has been also part of a uh, history right historically lead poisoning has affected five six seven times more black children than white children for example so that's also informing how we teach the issue and then you know have a hands-on approach on uh, in, in generating a, perhaps uh, a collaborative project i would encourage you to reach out to local universities um, scholars that have, um, you know, have uh, local or not local, right? We we are connected now, so um, work. Reach out to scholars, science, you know, scientists, historians, anthropologists that have worked on the issue that you you're interested, in, and you would be surprised how like open people are to to collaborating to give you material for the lessons for coming as a guest speaker. Um, I mean, I would love to do that, right? And, and then also collaborating perhaps with local um, environmental justice organizations, like Kelly was um, saying, right? And, and these, these are synergies that are ready to kind of um, take on because as, as the university, we're very eager to get involved with, you know, local um, collaborations and help with, um, help with science and environmental education in general. You know, um, if I can just add one thing to that. So when I started working with Dr. Rubio um, about this particular curriculum, Lead in Santa Ana as a case study, um, we were chatting about some things and I love that he said when he was thinking about this issue, it came from the community. It wasn't a researcher who had an inkling about something and then it was very top down. It actually was community driven because somebody had a noticing, somebody had a wondering about what was happening to children in this particular community based on some data that they see. So we will go into that next, but I just wanted to point out that um, the approach is essential. And just like how Dr. Rubio said to me, it came from the community and then they, they reached out and then had more collaborators to really amplify um, this effort. Um, the same goes for when we position students. How often do we say to students, here's your driving question for today. Here's what you're going to learn about. I have it all mapped out the whole month. But if we're thinking about authentic ways to position students and to allow for them to, to authentically, again, position themselves as knowers and doers of science and engineering, think about that approach that Dr. Rubio is going to share very soon as well about how it, how it really was driven from the interest of those individuals. And then the data and the science and the collaborations came in to help strengthen that collaboration to really then take action and do something about um, a systemic issue. And I know, again, as a former teacher, that's not easy, but at some point, are we able to dive deep, right? And think about what we value and believe for 21st century teaching and think, you know, maybe that it, there is one unit where I'm willing to to see what that looks like, learn from it and improve it every single year as I try it over and over again, right? In the process of science for myself. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to share that and then um, pass it back to you, Phil. Yeah, there's so many uh, intersecting strands there. I'll, I'll, let me just name a, a few of the ones that I that I hear, and then we can kind of go towards some of the, of the examples that you wanted to share today. A colleague of mine, a graduate student, uh, at, at the, at, in Seattle, Jordan Sherry Wagner was um, writing about 
railroad curriculum models, railroad track curriculum models. Like we often like create curriculum that is like A to B to C to D. And then we like try to like, you know, do hand waving around it to try to like create choice and agency, and, you know, perceptions of that along the way. I, and I, so I really love this other idea that's a community derived felt justice issue in response to an investigation that matters. And so like that is like this other and you know, science ed has some long history of doing issue-based justice-centered work. I think there's kind of um, it's kind of one important dimension of like seeking relevancy in in science learning. I would need to go back, uh, Dr. Lee, to kind of your equity journey reflection launch to this section, because I think often that's like detached and separated out from science teaching and the nature of science itself. And so like, I, I loved how you kind of like opened up like the self and the role as teacher and, you know, reflecting on science endeavor itself. I was um, talking with a colleague from Europe who found it utterly strange that graduate students in STEM fields in the US don't deeply study ethics. Because in, in the European context, ethics tends to be woven into the STEM disciplinary departments. But here we've separated out the fields that could be helpful to understand ethical reasoning and deliberation. And so like that structural history then leads to an image of science that presents these problems. So I'm kind of flashing on, on that particular piece. So with this kind of like grounding, uh, I kind of really am excited to have you just share some examples from the work that you've been doing, applying the, the fabulous frameworks um, that are in your book that you mentioned. So back to you to open up an example. All right, so I'm gonna actually pass this on back to Dr. Rubio because he already started talking about lead in Santa Ana um, and we'll share about his podcast too if you all are interested in hearing more. Oh, thank you, great. Um, all right, so I, I think I mentioned a, a couple of things about lead science um, and I, I guess the, the main takeaway there is that very much in this case, science did not produce the data that we needed. I mean, leave aside kind of the horrific history that this, this particular field has. Um, uh, nowadays, today, we do not have the, the data that we need in order to understand where lead is, right? Um, we do have measurements of lead in blood, but that, requ that, that requires that children get poisoned first, right? And even the, the mechanisms that trigger investigation are problematic. And I'm not gonna get into the details of that. But let me tell you the story of how our study started because I think that's gonna illustrate some of, the, some of the approaches that I would like to suggest for today. And I, I guess this story started in 2017 when a reporter um, in Orange County here in Southern California uh, walked the streets of Santa Ana with a question, with, with a hunch, basically. She, um, her name, is, by the way, is Yvette Cabrera, and she's an, um, um, a journalist, right? She, she walked the streets of Santa Ana, and her hunch was, um, I think that part of, um, that I think it's likely that Santa Ana is polluted with lead. And she brought in uh, a portable XRF machine and she tested the soil around, you know, schools, around um, different houses and, and open parks and, and so on. And indeed, she found alarming levels of uh, soil lead contamination. So within that context, um, Orange County Environmental Justice, a local organization, very young at the time, uh, reached out to UCI, where I work, and, and Dr. Lee also works, and they proposed a sort of community-based uh, research project. They said, we're gonna go systematically test the soil around the city, and we're gonna get in, uh, students involved, students from UCI, also um, volunteers and, and trained soil, soil collectors actually from this youth collective called Jóvenes Cultivando Cambios. And so they put this project together and they do this kind of soil collection and then they send it to the lab. And indeed, you know, there's, there's lead 
everywhere, right? I'm not everywhere, particularly in the downtown area, right? The historic downtown area. So start, people started then asking naturally, um, where is this lead coming from, right? And I remember I was in one of the meetings, membership meetings with OCJ, and I was like, that, that's a key question. And I think you need a historian to try to tackle it. Um, and I was not thinking I was going to do it at that time, but uh, then, um, you know, the director put us together in, in a room with like some of the scientists working in, in this project. And they said, hey, do you want to figure this out? And, and, and I took on the task of, of, of coordinating this team. And, you know, and over like it took us like a year and a half or so. And what we did is basically we started collecting historical data. Particularly, we started collecting historical documents, right? We went to the archives, we got very old maps, uh, we got aerial photographs that were taken in the 1930s, 50s, 60s, and so on, that kind of captured the city as, as it was back then. And what we did is we, um, we digitized all of that into the GIS system, into, the, into uh, a geospatial software, right? Basically, we created digital maps and we measure that against the digital maps of the soil samples, right? And we created all these correlations um, and different ways of looking at this. And what we found out is that, um, by the way, as we're doing this, we're in constant conversation with Orange County Environmental Justice, right? They are part of the research project, right? We discuss how things are going, we meet. Uh, like once a month, um, and um, you know we have we hear them out in terms of like what what are the most pressing questions. And obviously, in this case, it was like we need to, the residents want to know like what's causing this, right? And the conclusion that we arrived to is is that it's very likely that uh, leaded gasoline is basically emitted through car emissions during the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s accumulated over time in this very kind of heavily um, transited area um, in downtown Santa Ana, because that's where the 101 used to go through. So if you wanted to go from uh, San Diego to LA, you needed to go through downtown Santa Ana. They, the, the 101 connected through that downtown area and the traffic kind of congested over there. This was before the Route 5 was constructed, right? That kind of bypassed Santa Ana. So if you're not familiar with the history, you wouldn't know, right? Like, and I found out about this by looking at these old maps. And uh, we just see a strong correlation between traffic flows and, and the historic downtown road map with soil um, contamination. And I guess this has a very strong importance, relevance for environmental justice, not just because the most polluted places in Santa Ana are actually Latinx, lower income, you know, more renter occupied um, and, and Hispanic and so on. Um, so it's it's it goes beyond that. It it's doing this collaborative work created data that reframed the problem, right? It's not just that we're doing history and we're reframing the problem. It reframed the problem because basically the dominant way of approaching lead is very individualistic and is after the fact. So we basically treat poisoned children. And if there's um, a, a very heavily poisoned uh, person or, or, ch or child, we investigate a property and perhaps recommend you know, uh, remediation, particularly of lead paint. So we're very focused on lead paint. And that's the kind of a legacy that has a whole history to it in which the lead industries actually had a role to play. Um, so it's very individualistic. Our approach using this data is environmental and it's community level, right? We're saying this is an environmental issue, 
right? And we're sitting down with the city and, and uh, the county and having these conversations because they have a particular approach that they have been given by public health institutions and so on that have these assumptions, right? And we're challenging that with Orange County Environmental Justice saying, this is a community, um, this is an environmental justice issue that should be addressed at the community level, meaning we need you know, to approach it um, with a strong, you know, a strong public health approach and make sure that that approach is equitable, right? That we're not kicking people out of their houses, particularly renters, right? That we um, put some protections in place um, and so on. So this is just to illustrate how, you know, a question that came from the community triggered uh, an academic collaboration that was community-based and that also actually contributed, contributed to the organizing process, right? Because our study, which is gonna come out now and some of the studies that have come out already um, have helped these organizers um, teach about this issue and then leverage that data, that science, you know, scientific data to ask for, um, you know, public interventions and resources and so on, right? Justice. I, I'm going to stop there. I, I want to see if people have questions. You know, I, so just to add to that, I was thinking as he's sharing this story, um, can you imagine as a science educator teaching from the point of just current context without the historical background? And that's what I was sharing earlier about my own personal learning experiences, not knowing the history of my community and all the injustices that were taking place and having missed opportunities to engage me in, in those ways to activate that agency, to build my critical thinking skills, to, you know, X, Y, Z, all of those things. I feel like that's a missed opportunity. And if he isn't unveiling the system um, that is, is a uh, part of the problem, right? We're not then asking the right questions. And if you don't ask the right questions, you can't get to the right solutions. And these days, that exact same activating agency is such, it's like the new kale. <laughs> Everybody is saying, teach climate change to activate agency, but without unveiling the system, the historical injustices in place, how can any type of action help to move that system forward? And it's almost then, it's, it's misleading to students then to say, you can change the world, but not anything in my class, or you can change the world and do whatever it is you want, but I, I can't give you the full context of why this is a problem for you. So how then would they take meaningful action? And how can they rally support around their community to again, move the system? Because the system is made of people and we have to first have those conversations to unveil those issues. And so, I have to point out, and it's it's something that we've talked about um, in the past too. That you know, I my issue is the more we talk about environmental just or injustice, I should say, um, I keep having to remind myself as a person who grew up in these types of communities where I am firsthand being exposed and and seeing the human health impacts that are taking place. I might not have known it back then, but looking back, a lot of things start to make more sense when I look at it through this lens. I have a real issue with saying to my own students, this is what our community is experiencing. And let me empower, quote unquote, empower you to do something about the problem that other people have presented to you. It's, it's messed up is what it is. I will, I'm going to put lead in this community, whether people know it or not, or whether I meant to do harm or not. And let me activate agency for you to fix it that is misleading without unveiling the systems in place so that they understand the, the full picture of the issue and then understanding that if this is such a large issue, we need a large, drastic, urgent response. And so I, in my mind, when we're talking about um, lead in Santa Ana, and Dr. Ruby, you said this to, to us in the past too, this is a case study of one small place but it's not like this is the only place that is likely experiencing this. We don't know of other community issues that are actually happening right now. And if we then take a different approach of starting from community questions, 
community noticings and wonderings from where our students are and what they want to know about and what they're, again, what they're experiencing in their everyday lives, how then will we give them opportunities to apply that science content from the class to then do something about this, right? And again, in meaningful, culturally relevant ways. And so I'll just pause there um, and then we'll share some resources as well, but I'll throw it back to you, Phil, because I know you wanted to add. Yeah, um, such a, a rich uh, and important um, kind of vital line of work um, in that community. And I, I guess it has me thinking about different things. Uh, we just recently published a STEM teaching tool on how to identify um, environmental justice problems locally. And so that particular resource tries to pull together some national uh, kind of GIS system data so you can find you know, issues that might be local to your, your place. Um, or the communities where you work. And I know somebody in the chat also men mentioned that there's a, a lead issue in uh, the Tacoma area of Washington. So it certainly shows up in different places. And I, I guess I'm reflecting on in curriculum, we, we often focus on phenomena that are very short time scales that you can see happen right before your eyes, like as an investigative phenomena, or we study like deep time phenomena of like, you know, geologic kind of time frame kind of changes. But um, Dr. Rubio, what you pulled into focus is like a multi-decadal or maybe a century image of an unfolding set of human and natural system you know, interactions over time tied to urban planning and changes of transportation and energy sources and all of the infrastructure parts of society and choices that were made along the way. But then now we're here and we have a huge environmental justice injustice issue. And we're then trying to figure out, Dr. Lee, like you're saying, not to put it on the students to somehow say like, okay, now you live in this place that is deeply unjust, you know, so take agency and, and fix it. But it like, it becomes crucial then to tie, my mind was going towards the social justice movements or the larger collectives that can actually take civic action or political action in ways that might actually, you know, gain momentum and, and strength. So I I guess one question I have is just um, a bit of like, what does it look like to like round that corner towards civic participation? And like, how do you, is that the move to bring youth into that, into that space? Is that part of what, what you do with, when you work with teachers around this? That's a really good question. And I, I know I've been harping on this point and I have to go back to it, but it, it really depends on the teacher's beliefs and values of what 21st century science looks like. If a teacher is sitting there thinking, I don't think that's part of my job description, then, then yeah, you're not going to do it, right? But if you're really here and, and listening to issues unfolding in real time about what's happening in different communities and thinking, that's a teachable moment. I don't exactly know what I'm doing with it, but I do know that, um, especially if this is an issue that uh, directly impacts my students, I want to bring it in and I want to shed light on it and I want to showcase authentically how people are uncovering this and what they want to do about it. Um, then again, as you're thinking it that way, then you'll be more likely and willing to take it on and co-construct that experience with students. Um, with our teachers, we, we shared one um, other example as well. And um, Dr. Rabia, when we were kind of um, initially talking about this, we talked about redlining right, because it's so related to, to the issues of lead in Santa Ana as well. Um, and so uh, the, the redlining lesson plan um, sample that we shared that we created through Science Project was with another collaboration with, again, um, another social science uh, director from UC Davis. And again, it, it's to showcase that when teaching about tentative topics, um, and by tentative, I just mean there's no straightforward solutions yet because it's it's currently unfolding and people are still learning more about it and trying to figure out what to do about it. Um, the question is, how do I bring that in in relevant ways? But again, tap into those moments where students can be a complex critical thinker, understanding that there is no straightforward answer, but I want to help them to find a solution that makes sense that they can rally support around. And then activating agency around youth to power principles and learning from our young people. I think that um, in a lot of these conversations, we often position our youth as though they're, they're the ones who need more education, need more X, Y, Z. But actually, if you look around us, it's the youth that have been leading a lot of these movements. And we're catching up to trying to figure out what does that look like in our current curriculum? Um, and so 
Having said that, um, as you look through that resource, it, it does dive first into the social science context and the history of what's happening with redlining to introduce a different issue of uh, green spaces or lack of green spaces um, and uh, the heat island effect and what's happening in specific communities with um, uh, heat waves and droughts and power outages, et cetera. And really thinking through, well, with this issue of redlining and other issues that are related to it, what might a student do to then take action in, in their community? And we say it's complex and critical thinking because the answer, every I feel like everybody who initially hears about this thinks, okay, well then we'll just go plant trees. If the, it was as simple as planting trees, we would have already solved climate change, but it's not that simple. And it depends on the context uh, in which these solutions are situated. And we find out through that lesson at the end, we also help students to understand um, in Los Angeles, when the, the city engineers, environmental engineers were trying to figure out how to green these spaces, they thought, let's just put trees everywhere and that's the solution, only to find out that um, a lot of the VOCs or volatile organic compounds were actually being trapped under the tree canopy and people were inhaling these chemicals. And then understanding later on, okay, trees are not what's needed here, it's actually low shrubbery and they need to be native species that actually um, take out the VOCs and, and do less harm to people. The point is, this is the real, the very <laughs> genuine process of science and engineering that's taking place before our eyes. And it's okay to teach to students, this is how we learn and yeah, mistakes have been made, but without that historical context, without that deeper knowledge of how things came to be, we're never going to get to those right solutions. We just keep putting band-aids on these issues thinking, whatever trees work, <laughs> wherever we want to plant them works. Um, so we just need to dive a little bit deeper. But um, having said that, Dr. Rubio, did you wanna add anything or Phil? Yeah, or Dr. Bell? I have a couple of questions to strand together, but Dr. Rubio, do you wanna add pieces now or should I put questions on the table? No, I guess, I guess we, we can leave some space for, for, for the questions, yeah. Yeah, so um, you know, at some level, I think so. In one question, somebody's uh, worrying about the the messaging that shows up sometimes. That um, you know, well, the the standards are the standards, and so um, you know that's led to curriculum that doesn't do this local place based thing. And so districts might be trying to you know really uh, enforce the teaching of the curriculum that is detached from local place or other administrator you know blocking moves that might keep that local work from happening so i don't know if you have particular advice at the at the curriculum design level or at the adapting to local kind of in that as a strategy but um i think people are interested to hear a little bit about about that and so maybe i'll, I'll leave it there and see if you want to engage in some of those pieces and share some resources um, so I, I put some pictures up um, on the screen here, and I love that question because um, it, it's, it's a very real uh, issue is what I'll say. But at the same time, recognizing who your allies are in those spaces, also a, a, a very positive, good first step in thinking through how do I get this type of curriculum and support into my class? So the images that I'm showing you here, there are a couple things happening. Uh, one of them is for the Magnolia AgriScience Community Center or MAC. And um, the leadership here with the teachers advocated for a space to transform three acres of dirt, not even soil yet, just dirt um, into a community farm and garden to um, educate and support up to 30,000 students a year. This couldn't have happened without leadership support. That's just the truth. And so how did that process unfold and how did it come to be? And I, again, as a former teacher, I know for a fact that teachers have so much power, um, not only in the classroom, but as advocates for this type of curriculum. There are teacher leaders um, everywhere and people that listen to those um, individuals in um, leadership roles to advocate for, for um, important um, initiatives such as these. And my advice is don't give up. This started from one teacher who really said, we need this for years, years, said we have this empty plot. Can we do something? This is, this is what it should be. And again, um, there are other priorities in place, of course, but this person didn't give up and kept advocating for it. And at the right time, at the right moment, when climate change is now the new kale, this is when things started to materialize. 
So getting support, knowing your allies and working with local universities, local organizations, having it from the ground up, saying the students are wanting this, this is what it could look like, having parental support, all of those things will just help to speed along the process. But I don't think climate change is the new kale in the sense that something else is going to unfold in its path. This is an issue, an urgent one that will not go away anytime soon. And so the question is at what point do we get on board and do this in ways that are meaningful? There's other um, images here, but another school that we are, or district that we're working with, uh, we're creating uh, a climate change leadership pathway, an A through G pathway starting from freshman year going all the way to senior year with the support of the superintendent, the board, assistant soup, and all the teachers in developing this one of a kind experience for students to say, I want to open up a nonprofit that will actually support in these ways. I know how to contact my local rep. I know how to get funding for these things. We want to build students up in these ways using students that have successfully done this. We can learn from each other. It just depends on how we position each other. And again, understanding and recognizing those allies. And um, I know we only have a short time left and I want to make sure that um, Dr. Ruby also gets a, an opportunity to share like his top key takeaways before um, you know, we all take off here. Um, but again, those, that's an important question and don't give up. We know that teachers make the critical mass needed to mobilize on this. And again, I, I just think that it's so important that we recognize and acknowledge our teachers for everything that they're doing right now. Um, given all the challenges. And so having said that, sorry, I'll move forward here. Some key takeaways to consider. So this one is some things that um, I, I just drew from in the work that I've done, not only with teachers in California, um, through the book, through my research at UCLA, but if you're going to really think through some processes today, these are the three that I, I would love for you to sit with for a while. And the first one is that as a socio-scientific issue, climate change, um, socio-scientific issue is just an issue without straightforward solutions, and it is um, political in its nature, not scientifically, but <laughs> as portrayed in the media. This is an opportunity, hopefully not missed opportunities, to model the process um, and nature of science with students. And it's okay to co-construct those experiences and just be vulnerable enough to say, this is a new topic, we'll take it on together. I'm learning alongside you because I know if anything, students are very forgiving um, and very supportive, right? Um, and the second thing is I, I wanted people to think about how students, as we said earlier, shouldn't have to choose between content and context. It, it can't be that we only learn about photosynthesis or the atomic theory in the class um, and what have you go home to our lived realities where we're breathing in you know, terrible air, not understanding what's going on, but knowing that we have bloody noses to the point where we can't even lay straight down because again, these are human health issues that we're constantly dealing with, right? Um, or just closing the window when there's a quote unquote normal flaring event. Um, again, they shouldn't have to be disconnected. It's actually, again, another missed opportunity. And the last one is ask the right questions so that we can get to the right answers. So having said that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Rubio. Thank you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to repeat myself uh, too much. I, I just want to basically emphasize the historical nature of the content that we uh, teach, right? The, you know, science has evolved a lot, but it has a particular history, right? That has to be acknowledged and not only acknowledged, challenged, right? And I think schools can be an important site in challenging the way science works, right? Because uh, like I mentioned before, you know, there's, there's, there are many deficiencies now that have a particular institutional history. For example, we do not know where the lead is right now, right? We don't have public systems for monitoring exactly what the journalists did of just monitoring you know, the, the, the soil contents and soil pollution, right? Um, there's a major deficiency, right? And uh, schools can be a key player in articulating basically um, a different model of science that is more local, that is more engaged with like social and racial issues, right? That is community driven. Uh, that, for example, you know, there are um, scholars here at UCI working with 
several school districts and neighborhood organizations to work on air quality and air monitoring, right? That can be part of the school curriculum even, right? Like how that would elevate the school to a site uh, an effective, and, and the school already is in, in many ways, but it, in these particular issues, the school can be a site of environmental governance, right? It deeply involved in the key questions of producing data, you know, bringing attention to certain issues and organizing the community to, to address them, right? So that is in part part of the, the, the model that I wanted to pass on to you, which you may have heard about, but I wanted to illustrate how it operated, right? This community-based organizing and educating model, right? And how it operated in the case of Santa Ana. So fabulous. Thank you both. Um, you know, uh, let's, if, if we were in a big room together, there'd be huge applause right now. Uh, and people would be thanking you in person in that way that, that may happen again. Um, but thank you both so much. It, it, in acknowledging comments in the chat, you know, it is a very tough moment um, culturally and politically. And so, uh, you know, as, as kind of, educational equity itself is being polarized on the right, you know, by the radical right. It's creating spaces that make this work very challenging. And so I, I, in our implementation projects, we think about building our networks and building our capacity and, and um, practices as political organization. It's this, you're building, an, you know, a community to kind of hold a set of perspectives in relation to you know, holding on to the justice work. So if that if that reframing is helpful, and thank you both for this community centered driven ethical science model that you pulled onto the table today. I do want to like flash up. Oh, you can't quite see it. Uh, Dr. Lee's book, uh, please check it out. Uh, Dr. Rubio also on his personal website has a, a lot of different resources, a podcast and different articles about the work, both public facing and scientific articles. Uh, thank you all for that work. We will. Um, uh, a recording of this particular webinar will go up onto our climate learning section of stemteachingtools.org next week. So we'll link in to the in the show notes all of these resources and papers. So if you missed them flying by in the chat today, you can find them there. Uh, I want to thank uh, the other staff that have helped uh, get things ready for today. So Deb Morrison, who couldn't be here, Corey Shi, who helped with all the, the details of getting us lined up for today, and Abby Reinhardt holding down the, the tech dimensions of today. Thank you all. Um, please join us next month. This is a monthly thing. On April 8th from 11 to noon Pacific, we'll be visited by Lindsay Kirkland and Kristen Poppleton from Climate Generation who've been working for almost a decade on uh, bringing climate justice into uh, their climate change education efforts. So come back uh, next month and uh, take care everyone. And um, we'll hopefully see you then and I'll see you on Twitter and other places. Take care. <laughs>